Thank you to all of you for attending and the Creative Morning team for uh, inviting me out <clears throat> against my, well, certainly against my predilections to come out from my shell and speak a little bit. Uh, the reason why I chose the silent medium of sculpture is because that's the, that's a sort of a comfortable place for me to think and work. Um, but all of that said, these things, such things as this are, are good for you, aren't they? And uh, I very appreciate the uh, Creative Mornings Manifesto and the, and the welcome that that represents. Um, I uh, thought what we would do here today, uh, though, is to, is to, I guess, present from that, uh, my mother tongue, the uh, language of images, uh, which I generally speak in you know, three dimensions. Um, and then we would do a quick studio tour. That's where I'm coming to you from today. Um, with my uh, camera person there uh, and studio director Sage McGilvery, who's going to walk around with me to uh, try and present something of the flavor of the workspace. Um, but uh, on the theme of, on today's theme of monumental, which of course is a singularly massive and unwieldy thing to encounter uh, and to think about. Um, I'm doing really all I can do, which is to show you a few of the points of contact from uh, my own thinking and working over many years, uh, where it has, uh, you know, where I've made contact with that theme. And um, of course, it's a it is a massive one, and it needs a, a symposium, not a single voice, to uh, encounter it and to uh, try and work with it. But. Um, but on that thing about that theme, I was realizing that uh, among the most grand and impressive sculptural artifacts that I would have grown up being impressed by as, a, as an aspiring figurative sculptor, and I was that from childhood on, um, I am still, for that matter, an aspiring figurative sculptor. Um, but those, those artifacts would have been uh, the grand old granite and bronze um, Markers of uh, of the British Empire growing up in a in the colony of Canada, and um, so before I had ever had eyes or, or any understanding, let's say, of their um, their role as as instruments of colonial power, uh, I just admired them as beautiful sculptures, as amazing artifacts. Uh, I guess we're speaking here of that sort of. Uh, 20th century, vaguely classical to neoclassical imagery of uh, many war memorials, uh, images like that. I remember specifically a grand old equestrian monument that stood in the center of Queens Park. And again, that was and that is an apolitical view of those things as, as a, a gorgeous sculptural artifact. But going forward, uh, say 20 years from that child's eye view, I ended up at the Ontario College of Art, uh, studying under, and I guess further to this theme, uh, some of my um, artistic ancestors through OCA, uh, where I was uh, instructed by a, a, an old fellow called Bill Clemens, who had been a student of Emmanuel Hahn. Emmanuel Hahn had been a great German Canadian sculptor that designed all of our Canadian currency, our coins. Um, and uh, further on back to Walter Allward, with whom he had worked, uh, who was, of course, the architect, designer, sculptor who uh, designed and built the, uh, the Canadian War Memorial at Vimy. So, under the banner of monument, those seemed like. Um, interesting references to make for our conversation today. But the other thing that I was being informed about at the Ontario College of Art in mid 1980s. Um, yeah, and I guess I should be articulating here uh, for uh, the purpose of uh, good visual continuity that we're we should be into the slides that I've presented. So that first little ramble was meant to be under, under uh, this image. Under the second slide, a um, piece called Mass and Memory. I wanted to frame these thoughts, which is that um, 
I was just finishing up that last thought, which was OCA in mid nineties. Uh, I was really also being instructed that, uh, yeah, you might want to do this kind of work, but um, the figure as a mode of contemporary art making is is an extinct. It's it's a dead sea. It's gone. It's gone dry. There's nothing there. There's nothing to work with. <clears throat> it's irrelevant. Um, and that, that, you know, it's, it's extinction had to be taken seriously. Um, what I was doing, I was already pretty impassioned about doing what I was doing and I was still in my twenties. So I, I knew more than everybody else. Um, so I carried on doing what I was doing. So mid nineties, uh, early nineties come along and, um, I'm having this conversation about these figures and these plinths, um, which you know has resonance to the two motifs I've articulated to you so far about the uh, the monument and and the state of figuration. Um, and I'm having this conversation with my great friend and uh, art guru Bruce Van Slyke about the elemental uh, syntax of the monument. What's going on there? Uh, and there's our, this articulation that. Um, Human beings will gather at a site that is an intersection, um, uh, a confluence, uh, a, a place of a historical happening. And they will mark out a square on the ground and say, this, um, this, this site uh, has this particular meaning. And here in this place, we will erect uh, a memorial, a, a memorial culture, a cultural memorial artifact. Um, that will demarcate and fix this idea, this memory uh, into this place. And so if you take that, um, and there's art articulation also of how that, that goes not only to the political, but in fact, it's, it's almost um, a ritual and sacred observance that if you, if you look at, you strip all else away, this, this marking of place uh, has those sort of um, cultural dynamics to it. So that sacred square drawn in the earth, if you extrude it upward, becomes the sculptural plinth, uh, as articulated here in this piece, Mass and Memory, by a simple cardboard box. And so there is this, um, to think out loud about the syntax here, the, what the plinth does, it's this sort of ancient cunning technology by which your image, your icon, your emblem uh, will I've got the computer screen and paper notes and an analog watch going. Um, by which your um, by which your artifact will achieve a transmogrification of value in the eyes of any who look upon it. Um, so there stands this plinth raised up from the sacred square, mediating between ground and sky. That is between the register of the realms mundane and mythic. And this plinth is the main engine of the monument, and it doesn't matter what you put up there. Um, man, woman, or beast, monarch, guardian, idol, angel, pop icon, sports legend, it doesn't matter. Uh, whatever you put up there through the alchemy of the plinth will be a thing beatified in the brain of the beholder. And so there is these three key players in. Um, in the, uh, the syntax of monument, the ground, the plinth, and the figure. Figure in its broken state, um, the monument certainly in its uh, kind of chronically troubled state because it's, it's, a, it's a cultural lightning rod as much as anything else. But those three elements. If we can go to slide three, uh, we are hearkening back to the equestrian monument. And this is a piece uh, which I entitled Unsolicited Proposal for a Public. And the things to say about that are that it's, <clears throat> it's a tiny little thing. It's only six inches across. This is when I was modeling small figures in hot glue. Um, and um, gone, of course, is the, the exalted heroism, the hierarchies of the plinth. Uh, the exaltation of the figures, the presumed grandeur. This is, uh, there's an image of pathos 
uh, crumbling down here and um, into these elements. And uh, there's this impulse to kind of walk between these two figures to encounter this intimacy between these two figures. Uh, and that was an illumination for me, a discovery about how um, even these tiny artifacts can achieve, they can project in the mind's eye into this, to having this monumentality. And so um, that was an interesting discovery. Going forward to the next slide, which I guess is uh, number four. This is another uh, exploration in the Equestrian Monument. This is a piece I did in 1990 or so, titled Equestrian. And again, those allusions to the, the uh, heroic hierarchy of the Grand Imperial Equestrian Monument, but it has that reading from perhaps 100 feet away. But of course, as you approach, you see that it is being denatured and dissolved and unraveled and inverted all of its, all of its formula, uh, formerly heroic formulations. Uh, and there is within all of those dynamics, I, of course, this is also me learning the language of uh, figures in space. There is this reshuffling of our empathies and of our expectations. And in slide five, uh, I took that piece, the equestrian, and thought, well, it's achieved this, it's broadcasting this, this idea of monument, what would it be if we were to, and I say we here because it takes a team to make these larger artifacts, but if we were to take this and scale it up and have it in fact imposing as a monument proper, standing over, looking down upon the public square, done some various and guerrilla type installations of it. But uh, the thing that I learned as much as it was a, a beautiful experience artisanally to create this work, um, it had achieved much of its um, resonance as, a, as an artifact, uh, as, a, as, a, as an aesthetic artifact uh, at that original scale um, that is, uh, is not necessarily made better by being, by being simply writ large. Um, bigger is not better. And um, as a mentor of mine, a sculptor mentor of mine put it, uh, there's a scale after which the work stops being sculpture and starts simply being enterprise. So there was discovery to be had there about that. There's a sixth, uh, a sixth slide, which is another image of the equestrian monument. And, uh, and I make these pieces with my team and we, we talk about these things uh, in the making of them because there's this uh, philosophical attachment to the artisanal mode of creating these images. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, it's kind of in the making of them that you can discover anything about them because of the, the, the key, the essential sort of visceral vertigo of the sculptural artifact. You really don't get any sense of it until you're standing in front of it. It's, uh, it has an ecosystemic impact that is, um, does not transpose easily into other, um, into other representations of the sculpture. From here, I'm just going to do um, a, a run through a few slides, starting with number seven, um, that touch on our theme of monument and this uh, syntax of figure, ground, and plinth. These are two iterations of one edition work titled Mass and Memory Again. So this is the third time we've seen this piece. Different experimentations with that plinth element as a dissolving ground and in some sort of state of liquefaction, I suppose. Um, so we have this figure uh, and gone is the stasis of uh, the presumed stasis of the equest of the, uh, of the sort of tectonic monument. And instead uh, we have a figure upon a ground of being once presumed solid and now in a state of flux. The eighth image is a piece called watershed and uh, a figure atop this plinth is engaging in this act uh, It's ambiguous as to what it actually is going on here, but um, it's an act perhaps of vandalism and erosion, or perhaps of stewardship and renewal. The next image is called Fault Line. And um, we have the plinth, 
in this case, housing this small patch of earth in which is being, uh, in which this figure is even still drawing a line. Number 10 is the image called analog, the aforementioned Lego from Christine's introduction, a Lego figure. I've got a lifelong hatred for Lego um, because of its uh, prescribed, prepackaged originality. Um, and um, so it's uh, the, the will to refuse and reject that, any, any such mode of, of prepackaged originality. Uh, it's an important idea to get across to a community of creatives like yourselves. Uh, and as it says on a piece of graffiti outside of my studio building, resistance is fertile. And, uh, the next image number 11 is called Time in Memorial. And uh, another variation on the theme, a, uh, a demarcation of a classically sort of uh, architecturally defined space where the ground again has shifted and shifting and the, uh, the once solid plinth is uh, now all but a life raft to the figure involved. Uh, that was 11. 12 is a piece called Contrapposto. And here we see again, a figure in plinth in a relationship and a dialogue in which in this case, this plinth is buckling under the sheer weight of a preening classical affectation. Um, preening to the point where after looking at this figure for two or three years, I, I finally decided that the sculptural resolution, the aesthetic resolution it required was to knock the figure's head off, which I happily did with a two by four. And um, the, the other thing that was interesting about this work uh, is that with all of its classical affectation uh, intentionally kind of overplayed in this figure, um, you step back at these and look at these two things as a pairing of forms and realize that in fact, this simple minimalist buckle and cardboard plinth is actually a more dynamic and compelling and powerful figure than the figure is. Um, the 13th image is a piece called Founder and um, of tilting and toppling uh, monuments. Uh, there was this idea to, um, you know, what would, what would it be if that figure was somehow uh, trying to balance its own, uh, to, to accommodate the, the shifting ground. Uh, and I also want to show it to you because uh, just to say that I was shrouding monuments before it was cool. Um, the last piece is um, the last slide I think I have for you yeah, next in right line. Oh, no, I'm sorry. These, these pieces are uh, earthbound. Yeah, thank you. That's the correct image. This earthbound series uh, really is this inversion at the site of the sacred square where uh, instead of exalting up above the ground, um, perhaps above the natural order of things, these figure are, figures are in open collusion with the earth. Um, and finally, um, I'm just realizing I forgot to, with the next image, there is a whole series in my work of these suspended figures where they are uh, up in the, uh, sort of suspended up in the void. Uh, and these things also, it's noteworthy further to some other stuff I was saying there to uh, say, it's interesting to note that they achieve uh, a kind of a monumentality very quickly in the mind's eye because of their suspended status. They, they evade and they're, they're slippery with regard to the, the human scale. The last image is called Interval. And we're gonna go through the gallery and see this piece as well. But I made this thing 22 years ago. And in some ways it was the, um, it was my reason for coming to speak to you this morning is I thought, well, this would be an opportunity for me to get clear my thoughts on what the hell this piece is about uh, after looking at it for decades. You try as an artist occasionally to pin these things down. And so to that end, I wrote this statement on the work, which is interval is a sculptural disruption of the archaic equestrian hero. The cloning of the rider and mount is a disorienting feedback loop from which 
it does not recover. And to erect such a monument before the collective eye of a dissolving public is to make visible by cold estrangement the current that flows ceaselessly between the cultural anode and cathode of myth and power. Of course, having written that, I, I only feel that now I've got one more thing to figure out about this piece. But there is a strangeness to the work, there's an uncanniness to it. It's classical without any romanticism. It hovers somewhere between the Gothic and the classical. Um, it feels to me like it is a kind of a zombified iteration of the mythical, that is to say, a realm in which we neither disbelieve nor believe. Um, and the last question I would posit about the work for your collective consideration is, is it just me or do these uncanny twins not look a bit like Mark Zuckerberg? Um, Mark, if you're listening and we know you're always listening, I can make you a very good price on this fine bronze monument. Um, I think we're going to do a little walkthrough. Um, I can see what you can see. This is a piece of work in progress uh, that will be installed. Uh, I hope this summer a figure will be cast in bronze and she stands before two um, core 10 steel panels gazing through into a memorial garden, a piece called Nimina. And uh, I'm just going to let stage our camera person go at her own pace and uh, whatever makes sense without all of you getting seasick. Uh, you'll see various works in progress, uh, commission piece underway here as well. Uh, this lovely little weather affected wood sculpture. Um, smaller works in progress uh, in the form of the uh, Earthbound series. And uh, over this way, you'll see the metal fabrication area. The, uh, I had a client once come in who was very taken by uh, you know, the con conceptual um, energies in the work and was shocked to see that the shop was just so earnest that it looks like a, an automotive shop. In fact, that this is what it takes to create all of these artifacts and the, the aforementioned many, many materials that I work in. Uh, and then you all catch up into the gallery proper. And uh, I suppose at this point, I should plug the space and say you're certainly welcome to uh, make an appointment and come down and see the gallery. Those of you that are in Vancouver, uh, and I hope you'll come do that at your leisure. Uh, I believe you can make those connections through the website, which hopefully. Mornings will have posted for us. Um, this is a, a new work just completed, come up, just come from the studios of the gallery in the last couple of days. Uh, cast in cement and bronze, a piece called Millstone. Interval. Uh, we could not fit it here on its monumental plinth because we are, our ceilings don't quite get the height required for that to happen. And, uh, another, <coughs> another in a series of uh, suspended works here called Plunge. Uh, and there's this always this great joyous shout goes up when we get to hang these things in the gallery because they. All of a sudden, we see these amazing uh, dynamics of their shadows and how those play, uh, which is not always uh, anticipated. Um, so we 
can uh, set up back here at the, uh, the gallery desk and sit down there. Uh, I think the echo lends a certain authoritative quality to my voice, and so this would be a good place to do Q and A. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you so much, David. That was um, your your studio is incredible. I know a few few folks were asking in the comments where um, is your is that gallery accessible to the public? Are we able to, yeah. to go around? Where where is the gallery? Uh, the gallery is eleven oh one William Street here in Vancouver. Eleven oh one William Street. Yeah. I'm gonna... I, think we're, I think we're hooked up through the website for people to um, you know make an set up an appointment to schedule a time and and come by under all of the correct protocols. That's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so this is our opportunity. This is our Q&A portion. So if anyone has questions for David, um, uh, please raise your hand. Um, also, you can ask them in the comments and I can ask them for you. Um, I'm going to ask one of my own and then we're going to go. I see um, Shiraz up in the corner there. Uh, my question is just around how do you recommend that people like look at your your artwork? Like how do you look like um, I'm curious about this because a, a friend who has actually on um, H Creative Mornings does these uh, experiences called the art of looking where she teaches people how to look at artwork and let, how, how to let it kind of carry your imagination. But I'm curious what your thoughts are on how do people take in sculpture? How do people how do you recommend people take in your artwork? How, how, how do people do that? Or how, how would you recommend? How would you recommend? I don't know if that question makes well, sense. It might be partly answered by uh, uh, an allusion I made earlier to the idea that um, I guess actually, you know, part of the reason that I maintain a gallery here is that this is, um, you know, it's a, it's a visual, spatial, um, right, I'm supposed to be looking there. <laughs> It's a, it's a visual, spatial, but also a visceral experience uh, encountering a work of sculpture. They don't, you know, I, I maintain a website and we communicate the works digitally to people and on, on all of those good things so that, uh, you know, those can, those can do what they can do. But um, I maintain this gallery space because it's, it's, uh, it's just vital to, to have the, the experience of standing in front of these things it's also i suppose it's also the um the great flaw in my business plan is that uh, these things don't transpose easily to uh you know well what digital transportation or communication and so many of the modes um this is archaic real world real time spatial uh, space requiring uh, idiom um, so yeah, I, I, it's got to be in person, I think. Yeah, I saw somebody yeah. asking about whether or not they were allowed. I think they were uh, feeling jealous of the way you were interacting with the sculptures, and were wondering if you, they were allowed to touch the sculptures if they were to visit your gallery. Yes, in, in, under con highly controlled circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another question we have from uh, Dorothy Q is about whether or not uh, the sculptures are cast. Uh, there are cast. I think she means like, do you, do you pour it? Um, do you, sure. yeah, how do you make the sculptures? Yeah. The, um, so I am using sort of those traditional old methods of modeling figures in clay and well, the original could be clay or, or any number of different things. Uh, at which point the bread and butter of the studio the survival of it is based on producing the work in additions. And so that means mold making that produces waxes, that produces bronzes. Uh, so in that sort of thousands of years old tradition of mode and means of producing, uh, transposing a work from its original form into often bronze, not always. Um, but getting into the foundry casting side of things would be sort of the, the analogous thing would be a writer uh, getting into the business of publishing, sort of don't do all other industry. So there are, the, the studio has relationships with 
uh, various kinds of casting foundry facilities of different scales for different requirements and uh, set up a relationship there. And then what I do do, uh, unlike many other sculpture studios, is that we get sort of the works are cast in a rough state only. And all of the assembly and refinishing uh, and, and bringing you know, sort of revitalization of the work from that through that, uh, through the fires of the casting process, uh, bringing the works back to life, how it happens here in my own studio under my eye. Very cool. Wow. Um, thank you for that, that additional clarification around that. Shiraz, what was your question? Yeah, hi. My question is, how do you determine the size of the sculpture? Because I find uh, I love certain <laughs> poles, but I can't uh, look at it. It's too high. Or any other, you know, Churchill stages. Of how do the people determine the size? And what is the difference between a female who sculptures and male who sculptures? Is there any difference in terms of what they make and, and you or male in general? So two questions, gender difference and yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, determining determining of the, the size of the work, I suppose, is, is really utterly just about the context of the piece. But as I said, very often uh, these diminutive little pieces that I'm working on, they, they project into a monumentality and that's partly by way of these uh, the construction and contrivance and outward growth of these uh, tectonic and formal elements around that nucleus of the figure. So um, size is not as important as scale in, in, from a sculptor's eye. Uh, and that's all about uh, con contextual relationality. Um, a difference between male and female sculptors um, I don't know. I mean, I, the one, one framing I'm, I think about with that question is um, that there's been some question that may come up here today about why there's a kind of a preponderance of male figures in my own work. Uh, and, and that's partly from the, the kind of introspective ground from which um, these ideas, these reflections arise. Uh, and so there's an expedience to that. And so, you know, very often we, we frame uh, our little facet of the human condition uh, in terms and forms that, is, that are familiar to us. Um, but there are these, uh, yeah, there are these other pre-existing conditions uh, of, uh, on, on the artwork side of things, uh, for instance, male and female imagery there they are really freighted very differently. Um, they they have uh, they 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 each have a different kind of a burden that they that they are that is imposed upon them culturally to carry. So there needs to be sensitivity, of course, within those things. And um, um, yeah, you get into the weeds pretty quick with a question like that. Uh, but those are those, you answered those, it. Yeah, you answered it beautifully. Thank you for that reflection. Um, I want to give some. I want to give some time for some other questions that have been asked that are, are quite good. Um, what is the greatest challenge for you about your work, and what is your greatest benefit and joy? And that comes from Lee's. I think I pronounced her name correctly. Um, the greatest benefit and joy, and the greatest challenge. And we can spotlight Lee's too. If Lee's wants to come on, if she wants to add more. Uh, more context to that question, at least. <coughs> Pardon me, still getting over something myself. Um, the, I mean, uh, well, there is, I will maybe go to the, the second half first. There, some of the greatest joy in the work are the, um, the unexpected, the unintended, the, um, you know, I have this, this word about, about my work, which is that the work has better ideas than I do. And that points to this experience of um, stepping into the studio and steeping myself in all of um, the, uh, uh, the 
is the sort of the dynamics and the potential of that space, the space being not only an instrument of work, but, um, you know, a clear open nucleus within which to play and create. Um, so when those, when those um, cylinders are all firing, that, that is a beautiful, joyful experience when the, when the, when the work um, uh, yields more than was sown. Uh, you're getting back something, you're getting back something more and bigger than your, your own conceptions, your own ideas, your own intentions, that the work expands and explodes outward from that, from that, um, that place. Um, among the greatest challenges, um, I suppose there are, you know, I, I'm, I don't, uh, I don't know how many would identify with this, but I'm, I'm one of those, um, creative types for whom, you know, the cycles of the creative joy, uh, I have also to contend with another side of, this, of that wheel, uh, which is a sort of a, um, a little more on the depressive side. And so there is a cycle um, that is quite common to artists um, that, that, that is in its seasons, you know, let's say February, for instance, uh, where, uh, where, where I'm feeling that, that challenge pretty keenly, um, but uh, you know, I get reminded to to place myself in a to put myself in a, a mind space of, of gratitude, and that's a very good antidote. Mm, thank you yeah. for that. Yeah, I wonder if depression or those 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 experiences is something that is common to many of us right now during this. During yeah. This, yeah. yeah. Of course, yeah, it's been a deranging time. Um, I think we have a few more questions and we're also nearing our end, but I believe there's two more. Um, it looks like Alicia, um, her video is off, but here's her question. Do you continually explore new materials and what is your favorite? The Lego one was very cool. That was my favorite. Um, but I also uh, loved the, uh, the image of you knocking off a sculpture's head. I know that's not a material, but it feels like a... Oh. Um, but what's your favorite material to work with? Um, I, I'm not sure that I, I mean, I guess my, my mother tongue, as I said, is working in clay. That's what I was doing from childhood on pretty excessively. And uh, that's where, you know, some works of absolute staggering genius have been created. If, I, if you ever get a chance to see, you know, the portraits of Isamu Noguchi or the or the terracotta studies of, uh, you know, everybody knows Michelangelo's marbles, but his works in terracotta are, are stunning and breathtaking things, uh, near, near sacred objects. Um, but I, I have a, um, I guess I, I, I have a kind of a love of, um, of working, uh, well, maybe frame it this way, something like clay modeling, there's always this you're working on this continuum, uh, which is towards sort of greater and greater degrees of so-called quote, use the word realism for one of another term. Um, but when you, when I, when I'm exhausted by, um, you know, like a long season of work in that mode, uh, I fall over to the, all of these other very playful materials that are, Sometimes it's cast off and detritus and, um, you know, assemblage of different kinds, things that just break open your, your own way of seeing and working and thinking and, and that uh, present you with um, uh, what sort of fortuitous uh, accidents along the way. So things that, things that, um, that militate against any virtuosic notions you might have of, of artistry uh, so which is why you can see things all the way from you know the as i said the kind of neoclassical affectations of a piece like contra costo which is you know working at the uh, at the coal face of, of that whole aesthetic to something like these contorted lego pieces which you know, they are um they, they, they are sort of, the one gets co, get, I guess maybe they're kind of co-informed each by the other. And, um, and so it's that diversity and plurality and the surprise and the, 
the surprise of peripheral visions that, uh, that I like of changing it up and mixing it up in the way that I work. Change of, but was that last thing you said about peripheral visions? Like the change of? Yeah, it's sort of changing it up and being surprised by, by the things that, you know, whatever the severity are, and it's, I work on several pieces at once because the thing that you're working on, you know, it might be doing whatever it is, but it's only out of the corner of your eye that you see what's happening in, in another piece that you're working on. And that's, that's true also of the, um, the materials themselves. You, know, you can, uh, you can uh, be enlightened by, by accident. If you, if, you, uh, you know, if you do something else, you can suddenly realize what you're, what you're intending to do or where you should go with, it, with another given piece. Oh, that's so, Thank you for that. Um, we have, I think we just have three minutes left. Um, this is, yeah, they're just seeing um, lots of uh, comments. I'm just saying, thank you. Um, I see Mark with his hand up. Um, I also want to ask just this quick question is, do you get requests to make religious sculpture? Uh, I guess that has come up um, uh, on occasion, yeah. Religious and sculpture actually segues pretty well with what I've been thinking about. David, first of all, thank you. Uh, thank you for this. Um, I think I first mentioned this to you years ago on a culture crawl, and here we are finally hosting this conversation. This is great. You said something earlier today, uh, something along the lines of um, sculpture can be, among other things, a lightning rod, uh, a cultural lightning rod. And, you know, we live, we're living in a really strange time, really strange time where sculpture seems to be at the core of a lot of divisive uh, so social, cultural things. And so, first of all, I, that I feel is a very interesting thing to ask you about your thoughts on that issue. Like, when, you know, should we be tearing down sculptures that represented a, a different time, a different perspective, a di whatever, different heroes that are now seem so inappropriate? But really more pointedly, have you ever been? I've never heard any David Robinson con controversy, but have you have your sculptures? Because your story, you, you've you embed story and meaning in multiple layers in a lot of your work. And I can imagine you've pissed people off. Has that happened? Um, yeah, well, one one good hedge against that is to build the work high enough or far away enough that it can't get reached. <laughs> um, so uh, I have, uh, um, I, I do have, we, we have an, an unfurling of a, a particular issue right now with a, a commissioned piece uh, without going into any details of it, but it's, in a, it's within a private workspace. And uh, because there is um, some female nudity in the work that's been deemed to be sort of uh, problematic. Um, so I, I suspect that's more about um, some dynamics in that workplace than it is necessarily about the work because I, I find I can you know find a dozen billboards on the street far more offensive in nature than um, than what this thing has done. But um, yeah, what what more did you want me to unravel? I mean that that's a, a that's a staggeringly large scope and very good question. Um, do I think monuments should be being torn down? I, I think, uh, I, I don't think there should be, um, you know, a committee dedicated to the tearing them down of monuments. And I think we can leave, uh, you know, these things, these things will be the lightning rods that they are and uh, that, that they should precipitate. Conversation uh, is right and proper. And um, I think though, as I think of them as, as, um, you know, significant cultural artifacts. You know, we also have places in the world where great ancient historical works have been torn down by, uh, you know, various religious sects. Uh, and we, we in the West look very disapprovingly on that. Um, but the, uh, the, top, the tearing down and toppling and erasure of, of our own painful, markers of our own painful past, uh, well, like anything, need to be dealt with intelligently. But um, I think, as artifacts, they are um, 
I don't think they should be uh, destroyed and, and, and burnt and buried. I think they could be decommissioned and they could be um, markers that uh, remain for conversations subsequent to think, well, here's how we used to think. Um, uh, I think that's a, a two cent version. <laughs>